Thank you very much. I'm Matt Weeks, and I'm going to be talking about credential assessment. So first of all, a little bit of motivation. Um, I've had the uh, unique experience of being able to uh, see into a few of the different subfields of information security um, from working with exploit development um, and, and selling a few of those in, in college, uh, getting a math degree and looking at the cryptographic research side of things. Um, then I went into, um, in the Air Force, I was in the forensics lab and reverse engineering. I uh, did a lot of um, enterprise network hunt operations, so looking to find if network had been compromised. Um, and then um, I still do red teaming uh, with CCDC. Um, I, in my current position at Route 9B, um, I'm the uh, in charge of a group which is basically developing uh, software to detect malicious um, malware and, and uh, basically software development for security purposes. So there are a lot of people who have focused in one area who are a lot more experienced and a lot uh, better than I am in one area. Uh, but it's interesting seeing a couple different other subfields of information security uh, because there's oftentimes uh, some significant disconnects there. Um, between how people uh, view attacks and how other people see them occurring. A lot of times, I'd say most of the time, it's just due to a uh, difference of focus. Uh, but sometimes, especially when you're talking about uh, sp particular types of vendors or, um, or particular people pursuing a research angle, it might be, there might be some bias in there as well due to financial incentive, things like buy our product and it will solve all your problems, and some of the other uh, pitches there as well. And sometimes um, there's a lot of focus on things that are new and exciting and um, over those which we already know about, which are kind of old and boring, even if the old and boring still tends to be uh, more impactful. So Keeping this in mind, I was taking a look at a lot of the major breaches, and from a forensic perspective, a big question on the minds of a lot of the big organizations is, well, what, what does a breach cost? Um, how does something become a, a major breach, and uh, what, is, what is the biggest impact from that? And the highest impact breaches tend to come from complete network compromise. So you can look at a lot of different examples of uh, huge costs being levied on an organization as a result of just data stolen directly. So for example, Target, Home Depot, and JP Morgan Chase uh, were all known for uh, being compromised and having financial details like credit cards stolen from you know, tens of thousands of uh, credit card terminals, point of sale devices, or in JP Morgan's Chase, uh, more central systems. You've also seen uh, destructive major breaches, which in the past couple of years have started to become more common and uh, more, um, more significant. One of those was uh, with the, the owners of the Sands Casino, Las Vegas Sands Entertainment. Uh, another one was Sony, Sony Pictures Enterprises. Uh, Sony Pictures was hit. Uh, it was attributed back to North Korea. That attack left all of their systems offline and um, caused a lot of damage to, uh, to Sony. And then Saudi Aramco uh, was also hacked in a similar type of attack. Tens of thousands of computers were uh, wiped and generally everything on them was, was destroyed, uh, which took them a while to get back up and running. So when you look at a lot of these major breaches, um, you, the question naturally arises, what exactly is happening and, and how? And so the best um, after-the-fact report on what has happened in one of these breaches is probably the target breach, where we have the most information about it. And there was a great breakdown. I've put the link here. I'll have these slides up um, after, after the talk. And it went through each of the steps. And it broke it out into about 11 complete steps. But to summarize, the first step was the attackers were able to compromise a vendor, probably by using a social engineering email, something like, here, open this macro. Uh, here, download this executable. Open this executable in a zip file, something like that. They compromised a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning vendor. That vendor was contracted to work at Target and had credentials, had legitimate access to a particular web server, which they were using to uh, pass their information back to Target and get information from them. Having stolen those credentials from the vendor, 
the attackers were then able to use that access to exploit that web server. And once they had control of that web server, um, not just web interaction, but an actual uh, malware on that web server, they were able to see what security systems that Target was running, what antivirus they were running, and they took public malware and they modified it to be undetected by that particular antivirus and other public indicators of compromise that you may be looking for. On that web vendor, or on that web server, I should say, the attackers were then able to steal credentials. So they were able to found, find out that a target admin had logged into that server, and then using a tool like uh, Mimikatz or Windows Credential Editor, there are many different ways to do this, they stole that credentials of that administrator and used that administrator's credentials to take control of all the point of sale systems throughout the network, put their malware, which was known as Black POS, on the network, and launch it, which then intercepted all the credit card information that was um, being collected from Target at that time. At this time, they had done this attack. Target was still in the very early stages of planning out the um, chip rollout, and so everybody was uh, using uh, credit card swipes, which were uh, much easier to steal from memory. So what was the critical flaw in this entire process? Well, some of the first reporting on the Target breach came from Brian Krebs, and he wrote an article, uh, first article is that Home Depot was hit by the same malware as Target. Or I should say this is the first article on the Home Depot breach. So he tended to focus on, hey, look, this is a piece of malware that we knew about beforehand. It was only modified slightly, so why didn't they catch the malware? Other um, newspapers, such as Bloomberg, posted missed alarms and 40 million stolen credit card numbers, how Target blew it. So they focused on the fact, as you can see in the headline, that Target did have an intrusion detection system. It was a FireEye system, which had thrown some alerts during the process of this data exfiltration and exploitation. And those alerts got lost in the uh, barrage of data that a typical security operations center sees. And Target was unable, the, the people working at Target were unable to uh, filter out the signal from the noise and figure out, hey, these alerts mean there's actually something going on. Other, um, another article posted that, and I can again highlight just the, the highlighted part, they said a bottomless budget for security software, hardware, and services means little if you don't have the empowered geeks to help recognize a breach early on. And so they were pointing out the fact that even though Target had the money to spend on some of these expensive intrusion detection systems and some of these security operations center, they still got compromised because they didn't have good people running it, and they weren't listening to their people and, and making changes that their people were asking them to. They did mention um, the, uh, the chip and pin update. Target was also interesting because the United States Senate actually did their own report on the breach, and they called it a kill chain analysis of the 2013 Target data breach. They identified four major areas. First of all, they talked about opening access to the server from, from the outside, from a contractor. Second, they mentioned missing the alerts. Third, they mentioned um, moving between different sections of Target's network, and they were wondering why there wasn't a firewall or segments uh, blocking out these two sections of the network. And fourth, they talked about a different set of alerts uh, which their intrusion detection systems brought up. And uh, finally, um, another Krebs article again pointed to some of the same issues. All right, so to summarize, uh, they missed a malware alert. They lacked skilled incident responders to uh, deal with that. They had opened up access to a server to a vendor. Um, they didn't have end-to-end -end encryption. They, um, they didn't have isolation between the network segments. In the SANS casino, another major breach, which uh, th this time was a very destructive breach. Um, if you've read any of the accounts of this breach, it's really kind of um, shocking. It must have been an amazing thing to, to live through. I'll just read a tiny portion. When the attack hit, uh, the computer engineers raced to figure out what was happening. Within an hour, they had diagnosis. SANS was under a withering cyber attack. PCs and servers were shutting down in a cascading IT catastrophe with many of their hard drives wiped clean. In an effort to save as many machines as they could, IT 
staffers scrambled across the casino floors of Sands Vegas properties, the Venetian and the, its sister hotel, the Palazzo, ripping network cords out of every functioning computer they could find, including the PCs used by pit bosses to track the gamblers and kiosks where the slot players cash in their tickets. So I can only imagine people running down the hallways, you know, just pulling cords out of everything because everything was going down. And it didn't do a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of good because the attackers had already had access to everything. As, they, as the article goes back into the root cause, the attackers had initially compromised a system that was actually a developer system that a few of the engineers uh, working on software development at Sands Entertainment um, were, uh, were using and didn't have anything important on it, so it wasn't secured very well. However, what they used then was they were able to steal local credentials which enabled them to compromise other systems at the same site. And then on one of those systems, a highly privileged admin was logged on. They once again stole that administrator's credentials. And they were then able to move to the, uh, the domain controllers and the domains, uh, taking over all of, essentially all of the network of Las Vegas Sands Entertainment, which was more than just this one casino. It was a network of casinos and other entertainment properties around the world. So. Again, initial exploit via web server exploit, stole passwords um, in, in a uh, local sense, then found a privileged domain password, deployed the attack across the entire network. In this case, we don't see any example of any alerts missed. There were no examples of um, a third party being granted access. Uh, but once again, the same thing happened. In Sony and, Sony and Saudi Aramco, the attackers were a little successful in wiping everything on the network. And so in both of these cases, it is not uh, for certain what the initial access vector was. What they do know in both of these attacks was that in order to deploy their attack, uh, the attackers did use stolen admin credentials to again compromise the entire network, distribute an attack, and um, destroy a lot of data on thousands of systems. All right, so, so let's diagram one of these breaches and talk about how the security industry is generally addressing this. Um, so this is what it looks like on a logarithmic scale of how many systems were compromised at each of those uh, first 10 steps. And so you have to ask yourself, again, how do we, how do we stop this? Well, on the, the first end of the graph here, um, how do you prevent them from getting access to that one system? We have a phrase that we like to say again and again in uh, the security industry, which is, oh, this is how they got in. And once they're in, then they're in. So how did they get in? Well, in this case, you can um, restrict contractor accesses. You can try to find in it all of the vulnerabilities on your web servers. Uh, and there's a lot of an entire industry of uh, vulnerability assessment scanners, penetration testers to do this. Or um, as a lot of people were talking about, you can hit it on the other end of this graph once they've deployed their malicious software everywhere. And you can try to find that malware. The entire antivirus industry does this. Um, and you also have an entire threat intelligence industry to to attempt to d discover what these indicators of compromise are and, and stop them. And both of these are really important parts of a security program. But I have to ask myself, there's kind of something important in the middle here which kind of jumps out at you. And what happened here? In this case, in all of these cases, the attackers were able to steal the credentials to a highly privileged domain admin account uh, those credentials were left, in this case, on a web server or on another server uh, within an enclave, and then they were able to compromise everything. In all of these breaches, I'd say all, all six of the breaches that we've talked about, the credential theft has typically granted an attacker an access to thousands of times more systems than any vulnerability exploitation or um, user, uh, user compromise social engineering email. And so malware detection and vulnerable systems are, are both important issues, but in my opinion, the biggest enterprise problem is administrative credentials lying around all over the domain or credentials lying around the domain which could be used to obtain those credentials. And so how, so, so the first of all, ask ourselves, is this a problem that's really getting its uh, due mention? When you look at the coverage of these breaches, uh, you, tar you start talking about the do a Google search for the initial access vector and you get almost 500,000 results. All the front page is talking about the, the initial access in the headlines. If you search for the malware, you get another almost half a million results. Again, everything about the malware is in the headlines, the title of the page. If you search for domain admin or anything equivalent, talking about the credential theft in the middle, you get 
vastly fewer results. None of the results are focusing on the credential theft in the headlines. Normally, they're buried in step five of the 11 steps or somewhere else in, in the process. So there's very little attention paid to this in terms of instant reports, uh, news coverage. And not just instant reports and news coverage, but also in, in our area of security research, there's often not a lot of focus on credentials. And to illustrate that, starting in 2001, Microsoft added something called uh, WDigest support, which was a way to use uh, Windows integrated authentication. Basically, you sign into your system, and then you can, with Internet Explorer or another compatible browser, go to a website. It will ask you for your credentials, and it will do a challenge and a response and, um, and authenticate. Now, it's been able to use NTLM for a long time. What they added in 2001 was WDigest. Now, NTLM uses the user's uh, NT password hash, and WDigest used an MD5 of the user's password. And as a result of implementing the support, what Microsoft did was store that complete password. It was obfuscated, but it was stored in the memory of the LSAS.exe process. And this was implied by documented features. This is a page that was up on uh, in 2003. But it was not exploited offensively until 2012, almost 10 years later, when Benjamin Delpy, who is not a dedicated security researcher, released a hobby project, Mimikatz, where he was reverse engineering some windows and went, huh, you can get somebody's password who's logged in by injecting into LSAS, following a few pointers, and calling a function to deobfuscate memory. In these breaches and others, the documented impact of Mimikatz surpasses that of virtually any exploit released in the past five years. And these credential attacks tend to, tend to lead in real world impact, but again, they receive uh, very little research attention compared to uh, vulnerability exploitation. And so that's something that I think that, that we can fix. All right, so, so you might ask yourself, well, why is there such little interest in this topic? And I think there's a number of reasons. The, the first thing is that there's, there's often few visible alternatives. This is the technique that is used by Windows to do single sign-on. When an administrator logs into his Windows box, he doesn't want to sit there and type in his password every time he needs to open up group policy or open up his email or go access a file share. That all needs to be a single sign-on. And so a lot of people look at this and they say, well, you have to cache credentials, some kind of credentials in memory uh, for that process. And so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of emphasis on that. A lot of people say, well, you know, gee, you shouldn't have had a password which could have been cracked. You shouldn't have um, logged into a system. You should have known that you should have put your password on that system. And a lot of times, because I think there's a little bit of a lack of imagination, we don't see uh, any other way to do it. So how do, we, how do we defend against this? Um, and I'll show you what, what we do um, as part of our credential assessments. Um, so we'll go in and, and assess people's security like probably many of you work at uh, security companies where you do uh, security assessments of companies, red teaming, pen testing, that kind of thing. Um, I would suggest uh, doing a credential assessment as well as a vulnerability assessment. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll identify the credential dissemination, so figuring out where are all the credentials that we can find across all the systems on the network? Next thing that we do is we identify reused uh, credentials. This is a huge initial uh, vector, uh, especially with things like local accounts. Um, you find uh, the same, often the same local administrator account is enabled on every system across uh, the domain or across a particular organizational unit. And so you can dump the hashes from one system if you compromise that one system, and then use it to go on. Um, also, you find this a lot with domain accounts as well. Uh, what we tend to find is that administrators have a, have a habit of using a particular password every time they set up a new user account. And so maybe this is one that they use, maybe this is one that ends up getting shared with other administrators, or many of the, maybe this is one um, for users as well. Um, they'll just set up a, Every user account they'll set up, they'll set up and use password one, two, three for the password, and then tell the user to change it later, but then the user never does. And so this happens for a lot of reasons. 
Um, the next thing that we do is after we've identified where these are and what the credentials are, uh, we'll look at what the impact of the credentials are. So basically, who has, what is, what is the uh, group membership? What, is, uh, what are all the groups that everyone is a member of? What are all the privileges that those groups have? And what privileges have those groups been given on different systems? And what is various configuration settings of those systems to figure out um, how you can, uh, who has rights over what systems? And then once we, once we do that, um, we want to determine mechanisms to break those chains. Then once we have that, uh, we can help the company clean up their credentials and determine changes to prevent it from happening again. And then importantly, continuing to audit because a lot of times these things tend to tend to revert and go back to, to the way they were. <clears throat> so first, um, we scan and collect data from across the network. Um, here's your simple, meaningless hand wavy diagram. Um, we run a collector on each of the boxes. That all comes back into a database, and then we do queries on it to make the nice graphs and things. So data collection, um, what we do on each of the systems is to, um, as this, this type of assessment, uh, works best as a white box assessment. So we'll start with uh, credentials and account that someone has already given us so we have rights to do this. Um, you can also do something like this in an offensive penetration test um, where you use only what you have access to initially and then try to build up your access um, as you go along. Um, that can be a little more intrusive depending on uh, what techniques you're using. So we prefer to do it as a white box. Um, and so we have a small collector which runs um, and then cleans up afterwards. Um, that will try to find all the credentials. Find all, so that's things like uh, hashes on disk, hashes in memory, Kerberos tickets, passwords. Um, people save passwords in their Firefox and IE and Chrome and um, you know, all that kind of stuff that we can find. And then what we'll do is we'll find all the user accounts on the system, all the local accounts. If it's a domain controller, we'll pull all the domain accounts or you can remotely query the domain controller using standard tools. Um, identify all the privilege assignments. So this is um, who's all been granted what rights. Um, a lot of times it's not necessarily clear because the admins are seeing this from the perspective of uh, group policy. Um, if you saw the uh, talk a few hours ago on, on group policy, there can be oftentimes a lot of different group policy objects and they can all be applied uh, with different settings to different organizational units. And a lot of times the administrators who are looking at that console uh, might think that one thing is, is being applied to a system, uh, but when we scan the actual system, we see what's actually been applied. Um, and then we uh, record all the system configuration details, uh, which are relevant, and, and group memberships. So um, then we try, to, we try to draw that links. And what's interesting is that having started to do this and then tested our results against different configurations and different systems we've uh, found out in the wild. We've gotten uh, surprised a lot of times by how things work and, and by how, um, how their different credentials can be used or can't be. So for example, this is something we see commonly. Uh, we'll have two different workstations, Alice and Bob. Uh, they have different local accounts, but they both have the same administrator account. And it has the same password or password hash in this case. So, uh-oh, you can steal the hash from Alice if you've compromised that system and use it to compromise Bob. Um, but in reality, um, nope, our link is not going to work, so we're going to skip that. Uh, we, we go ahead and try to run this attack uh, using a Metasploit past the hash, and we get exploit failed, um, status logon failure. But the administrator's in the administrator's group, so... Why could this fail? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is back in the good old days, you could, if you had an account and it was in the administrators group and it was enabled, you have to check if they're enabled too, then you would be able to use that to remotely access this system. Along came um, Microsoft's uh, user account control or UAC and they decided, you know what? This happens too much. These are local accounts. They shouldn't be used for remote administration. So we are going to block them from privileged network logon. And so starting in Windows Vista with default UAC settings, um, admins, it's the, the default setting is called run all administrators in admin approval mode, although you can change that default setting. If that is set, then uh, the local administrators will not be able to log in. 
except for the 500 account or the built-in local administrator, which has its own set of rules. And so that local administrator will be able to remotely control um, all the other systems with network log on. Um, unless you have another setting, which by default is turned off, but if you have that setting called admin approval mode for the built-in administrator account enabled, then that particular account will be denied access. And so, okay, you go in and you see, oh, well, in this case, I have that account enabled. Uh, what happens if I disable that? Um, back to the default settings. So we try our local administrator account again, and status logon failure again. So, so now what? We've, we've got an account, we've got the credentials, the account's enabled, it shouldn't be UAC restricted. As it turns out for non-domain join systems, we have a setting called force guest, which is enabled by default, which means um, it has the same effect to local administrators. They are blocked and only given guest access. Um, they're not given uh, their administrator rights like they have uh, been given before. So authentication is complicated. Um, you have special rights assignment, such as um, this is just the, again, non-default settings can be applied. You can use SE deny network logon right to deny access to certain groups from the network, or SE network logon right to grant access to certain groups from the network. You have special SID restrictions. So if a particular account um, starting in, I believe this was an update available for Windows 7, but starting in Windows 8 by default, um, you can now apply uh, restrictions to a special SID, which is basically a special virtual account, um, which encompasses all local accounts, or all local accounts who are members of the administrator group. And you can, for example, specifically deny them access to the network if you want to lock down your systems, which I recommend. Um, and then you have firewall policies, which of course can, can directly block inbound uh, communication. And all of that um, applies and will uh, restrict or enable someone who has an administrator account on that system from uh, running processes with full system control via remote service management, this is what the PS exec tool does and the Metasploit module there, or remote file share access. So uh, there's a technique known as the WBEM MOF method where basically you just drop a file in a particular folder of a particular type that will be parsed by uh, Windows management instrumentation backend and then executed uh, with complete privileges. And so if you can uh, drop that file there, then you can also take over the account. Um, or remote registry access, such as setting a run key or setting um, different, uh, different other registry keys. Or remote task scheduler, such as by creating a scheduled task and then launching it, which can also run with full uh, system control. Or remote WMI, uh, Windows Management Instrumentation runs its own remote procedure call server on a different port, and you can use WMI. It's one of the most direct methods to execute a command on a remote system. And then finally, there's Windows Remote Management, uh, which is the basis of PowerShell remoting. So if you've seen some of the new techniques now available for uh, Windows PowerShell remoting, it's a very nice way of uh, managing systems that also uses the same authentication backend. However, um, there's an entirely different set of rules for remote desktop. User account control it does not affect remote desktop, which is um, another big uh, kind of hole in the, in the process which has been opened up by, by the settings. So even though local accounts now are blocked from remote access by user account control by default, if remote desktop is enabled on that system, they can still remote desktop into that system. However, to remote desktop in, you need the actual password. You can't just use a password hash. But that can be changed now with the introduction of um, restricted admin mode for remote desktop. And this is a new. Uh, a new setting which Microsoft introduced uh, not long ago, about a year and a half ago, to allow you to remotely control a system uh, without giving that your password or hash or Kerberos ticket. So if you authenticate with uh, restricted admin remote desktop and restricted admin remote desktop is enabled on that system, uh, you will just do a network level authentication. You will not send your password to that system. So it's a great way of avoiding giving away your credentials to these web servers, but um, it also opens up the ability to pass the hash to a remote desktop endpoint and bypass user account control. And, um, and the, the other thing which is interesting about this is the documentation 
on MSDN from Microsoft is not always correct either. So it's always important whenever you have a particular set of uh, settings or a particular configuration you want to test out, always test it and make sure it actually does what you think it's going to do. Um, because sometimes, especially when you have non-default settings, uh, the interaction between these things can um, cannot work out the way you think it does. Finally, if nothing is open, so suppose you have remote desktop disabled, you have force guest enabled on the system, you have a firewall blocking all remote connections in on all the ports. So without targeting the user, you know, convincing the user to do something, and without using an exploit, can you take over that system? So how, how would I take over that system? Well, if you were paying attention to the talk a couple hours ago, um, the answer is, of course, yes, you can take over the system. Um, and you can use group policy to do that. Because um, if you have the rights to apply a group policy object or modify a group policy object which is applied to the system, uh, you can have it run a scheduled task and uh, run whatever you want. Um, and so all this is important because we basically, we don't want to go down the same route which has happened in vulnerability scanners where when you scan a web server, for example, um, you'll often get thousands of vulnerabilities um, in, in a particular PHP install, for example. But if you look closely, all of these vulnerabilities are actually only a vulnerability if you allow untrusted users to run PHP code and rely on the PHP sandbox to prevent them. And so in most installations where uh, untrusted users are not allowed to execute code on the system, none of these are vulnerabilities. And so what happens is a lot of times in the security operations center or uh, IT management, they'll get one of these reports that'll plop down with a thousand different vulnerabilities on a thousand different systems, and they'll get ignored because they'll all be looked at as low priority or, or not something important. So it's very important to, um, to us to make sure that when we're saying, hey, these credentials can be stolen, your entire network can domino down, that that actually happens. So to put it all together, um, as an example, we have three systems here with a domain controller and domain join workstations. And we're going to say what happens if uh, Bill Loney, who is just a random user on the system, on the network, opens up a phishing email and gets compromised, his account compromised. So the first thing that we do when we pull this up after having uh, run a scan and collected all the information is we see Bill Loney has no rights to anything. So he, there's no link from him to any of the systems. However, there is a link to a reused credential node, which means he is sharing a password. So who else is sharing that password? Well, in this case, six other accounts share the password. And that includes some local accounts um, and some domain accounts. Um, this frequently happens with uh, local accounts because with domain accounts, there's at least some visibility to the administrators. They can see, uh, do a query and see, ah, who has not had a password changed in the past 120 days? Or you know, who hasn't had a password set? They can, they can do all that. That's not easy to find out for the local accounts on a Windows domain um, who, can, who has these, um, hasn't had their password changed in forever, et cetera. So two of these local accounts, um, have admin rights over their respective systems. So these are probably the built-in uh, local administrator account on those systems. So if you had compromised Baloney's account, you could then use that password or that hash to then compromise these other systems. And once you had compromised those other systems using these other accounts, um, you could steal the uh, Kerberos ticket password hash or password from any of the people who are logged into those systems. And so on one of those systems, there was a token, which means there's a uh, password hash or, or password or um, Kerberos ticket for Sterling Archer. And Sterling Archer is a domain administrator, and he has rights over the domain controller. And once you have rights over the domain controller, then you can control group policy, and you can control the entire domain and all the accounts in it. And then your entire network is compromised. So this is a pretty common pattern. We've simplified it here to just a few tests. But in most of the networks that we go and we do a credential assessment on, we can automatically find a path to domain admin from 99% of the systems on the network. And so this is, again, a very common um, layout of, of what that network looks like. We also see a lot of uh, non-shortest paths as well um, throughout, throughout the network. And so 
Um, one of the other things that we want to do is we want to help people remediate that action. So we say, well, what happens if, you know, we know this guy has been logging into somewhere he shouldn't. What happens if we disable his account, take him out of the picture? Well, in that case, um, you know, Bill's fish still matters. He can still compromise uh, these local systems, um, but it's not immediately catastrophic. It doesn't result in full domain compromise, and it doesn't uh, go past a few systems. All right, so um, having, having seen all this risk, what can you do to pr help prevent this uh, from happening on your own network? So the first thing I'd recommend doing is blocking local accounts from remote access to domain systems. So use some of those uh, local account uh, special security identifiers to block network logon and block remote desktop logon. Make sure you get both of them. And then uh, use some of the newer features in Windows 8.1 and 2012 um, and uh, Windows 10 and 2016 as well to prevent giving away domain credentials. So you can go into group policy and you can actually prevent people from um, giving away their credentials to a remote system via remote desktop. Um, make sure you first enable restricted admin, then test it out to make sure that will work for your administrators before you go on to forcing that because otherwise a lot of things will, uh, will not work as expected. And so this will help a lot with um, uh, preventing your administrators from giving away their password to different uh, different systems. Another thing which um, I highly recommend is at least for your privileged administrator accounts, don't use passwords. I'd recommend using smart cards for those. Uh, you can get uh, tokens for about twenty twenty dollars, um, and they can they can help a lot because there are simply so many attacks which rely on reused passwords, weak passwords, um, guessable passwords. And, and most of the time when we get into a network, you can crack a very high percentage of the hashes on that network. Once you've done that, I have a little bit of a uh, PowerShell script here. Uh, you can Google, this is uh, taken from um, Chris Campbell, uh, who has a Twitter handle ObscureSec, and he has a little, a little PowerShell script which can enable you to randomize the hashes of all of your smart card users. And uh, what that will do just by toggling an attribute. So that means even if somebody did steal the password hash, um, they would quickly find it um, invalidated. And this tends to help with things like um, backups. If somebody found an old backup of a domain controller or something like that, they were able to extract out uh, password hashes, you would be able to uh, invalidate those credentials. And then I also recommend um, changing the curb TGT account password on a regular basis. This is, again, a persistence um, issue. Don't have a lot of time to go into it in detail, but this is basically the, the key used for Kerberos authentication within the Windows domain. So if any attacker has this and you don't manually change this at some point, um, they will be able to use that to regain access to your uh, entire domain. Uh, finally, um, authentication policies and silos. Um, you can now use those to restrict the source of logon. In the past, you could only restrict the target of logon. So you could say, hey, if this account was um, this account shouldn't be able to log on to this system, um, but if somebody had stolen that account's credentials, they could log on from anywhere. With authentication silos, uh, you can now restrict the source of that as well. And you can combine those two to, to help prevent people from giving away their credentials to a place where um, they shouldn't um, and blocking them from abusing them if they were stolen. Um, blocking NTLM for domain servers is also something I recommend. Um, reduces the impact of uh, stolen hashes. And um, you can use the privileged access workstation model, again, something else to Google, uh, which helps you uh, logically organize your network in a way where the highly privileged um, users will never be able to log into the, uh, give away their credentials to the lower privileged uh, systems, but they will still be able to manage them. And finally, uh, using tools to continuously audit. Uh, so with, with Metasploit, you can do this uh, manually. You can compromise a system, uh, identify all the credentials you can find on that system, um, test past the hash, um, to, to validate your controls. It's a little bit clunky because it's really an, an interactive uh, system to use against one, one system at a time. Uh, Bloodhound is a new um, release as of a few months ago. Um, this is <coughs> designed for uh, offensive use. Um, it uses uh, information available to low privileged users to attempt to map out where different people are logged in from and so where their credentials are, and then uh, what those different accounts have administrative privileges over. Uh, so it does a quick assessment. It can't see all the uh, details of the privileges and all that kind of stuff, uh, but it is a very um, very handy tool. It runs very fast. Um, it's great for pen testers, and it is open source as well. Um, 
uh, lastly, we have our own tool, which is Orcos. Um, this one is a, uh, full disclosure, it is a um, commercial tool, um, but it does a more comprehensive collection and, and tends to find all those other links. All right, so in summary, pay attention to the credentials on your network. Uh, make sure people are assessing your network for risks, remediate those problems, and uh, try to prevent it from happening in the future. And so with that, do we have any questions? Any questions anyway? Could you give a few words on trusts and domain trusts when you have, uh, so bigger enterprises yeah. usually have either their sub companies or other things where you have trusted setups between different trees and, yeah. Yeah, so that's a very good question uh, about domain trusts. The, so the, the, first, uh, the first thing you should uh, remember, and this is, I didn't cover it, but the um, PowerShell team at Veris uh, has done a great job of um, using trust within a forest um, to, if you have compromised any domain in the forest, you can basically uh, tell any of the other domains that you have a Kerberos ticket valid for one of their administrators. Um, and so using something called SID history and Kerberos tickets. So it's important to remember um, that, that our, and, and Microsoft acknowledges this, the, the trust boundary is the forest itself. So you cannot prevent someone who has control of one domain in your forest from compromising everything else in your forest. So that's a very important thing to remember. Um, however, between forests, if you have trust between forests, that's a little bit different because those uh, attacks don't work. Uh, between forests, basically what you, what you really have to do is um, look at what rights each of those user accounts has been granted um, and, and follow this. Um, you know, use something like Orcos to um, I identify or Bloodhound uh, to identify, hey, what are all of the users who have access over this system? Um, and even if they're in another domain, uh, they should still work um, and tell you who has access to that uh, because they'll show up in the administrators group. Any more questions? Okay, thanks very much, Matt. Thank you. <laughs>